church that is called to be faithful, not to survive. Our goal is not survival. Our goal is faithfulness. Imagine if Jesus said, you know what? Let's rethink this crucifixion issue. I have to survive. No, faithfulness. Whether you're in slavery in Egypt, you're going to the promised land and the Red Sea is in front of you, the cross and the tomb is in front of you, the goal is always the same. As long as you're able, you preach the gospel and you remain faithful. Every presentation I've had for the past three years, I've used this picture. I love his beard. <laughs> Reverend John Malinowski has a beautiful beard. And in this talk, I'm going to speak about, this is one of the earliest priests that worked in both the Catholic and the Orthodox Church. But we want to speak about the Ukrainian Catholic Church in America mostly, and then we'll go over into... Ukraine a little bit, but we want to speak about how we have done this message of preaching the gospel and how we have been faithful. We forget sometimes that our ancestors came here as strike breakers in the coal mines. The people who owned the coal mines were having trouble with the Scottish, with the Irish, and they needed some cheap labor, and that's when our ancestors came in. Not everyone, however, came here. The first businessman who owned a hotel in Denver, Colorado, came over in the 1860s. His name was Makohon, and he did a very smart thing. He married the owner of the business, his daughter, and when the father died, he took over the business, the Occidental Hotel in Denver, Colorado. And uh, he was one of the first business people that we were able to find. Uh, and this was listed in Parshi Immigrant of America, a little booklet put out by uh, the Ruski Narodi Soyuz, the future Ukrainian National Association. What's in the name? Catholic, Greek Catholic, Ruthenian Catholic, Ukrainian, Byzantine Catholic. Every church calls itself by a nice name. But I always say, a bunch of sinners would be the most accurate name. When you, when you read history, and you actually read their original document in English, the name for our church is Ruthenian Greek Catholic. So whether the future Byzantine Catholics, the Pittsburgh jurisdiction, and the Philadelphia jurisdiction, we were both called Ruthenian Greek Catholic. And Rusenet was a name often used in the 1880s, 1890s. And in fact, Ortensky, when I did the biography, I was only able to find one document that he signed, but he didn't write, they use the word Ukrainian. So even though we call it Ukrainian, historically, you have to understand what they meant by that. And the last quotation I've used a lot, but when John Carroll became the first Catholic bishop in the US, you know that his uncle was the first signer of the declaration, the only Catholic signer of the Declaration of Independence from Maryland. Uh, he wrote a letter to the Vatican asking to use English, and the Vatican refused, and he said, we are asked to preach the gospel to everyone using a language understood by no one. So, language is always an issue, and if you remember, when Silva Methodius formulated the old church Slavonic language, there was arguments that we should not use this language to pray, we should stick to Hebrew, Latin, or Greek. And so it was the Vatican, the Pope, that said, no, you can praise God in any language. Before the church was organized, there were brotherhoods in America, and they were influenced by the mutual aid insurance organization 
of the Anglo-Saxon and Dific Slavic neighborhood. And these people loved uniforms and military parade drills. People love symbols from gangs to churches to governments to all sorts of private organizations. Whenever you study history, never forget you are studying human beings, men and women who have the same issues psychologically, spiritually, emotionally, developmentally as we do. Now who served these groups of Ruthenian Greek Catholics, Irish, Polish, Lithuanian clergy? These are some of the organizations in the 1800s. The St. Nicholas Brother in Shenandoah is often considered the first organization founded in 1885. America, the first newspaper, came out August 15, 1886. Do you know what its first article was? Dedication of the Statue of Liberty. We had Saturday and Sunday schools, reading rooms, cooperative stores, choirs, and drama troops. So even when Father Ivan Vojansky was here, his wife Pavlina was noted to take a very active part in some of the drama, and they would go up to Kingston, Pennsylvania, Freeland, Pennsylvania, Wilkesburg, and all those other towns to perform theater plays. Let's skip that. With Russian Orthodoxy, when we bought Alaska, the reason I mentioned this is when you have Ukrainian Catholics or Ruthenian Greek Catholics and you have Russian Orthodox, Christians always want to convert other Christians because it's easy. <laughs> you don't want to go after someone that's going to kill you. You're going to say, let me, you come over to me. Now once again, these are both sinners, so the way I look at it is, come to us, we will hit you less than the other people. Oh we're going to hit you because we're sinners. You know, we're going to do bad stuff. But if you come to us, we'll do it, we'll do it a little bit less. So Father Hapius Honcherenko was the first Ukrainian priest. He was Ukrainian Orthodox, and he ran the newspaper, the Alaska Herald, that, that was there to teach the Russians how to become Americans. Now, the reason I put the dates there is, in 1871, the Russian Orthodox bishop transferred to San Francisco. There was only one Russian chaplain in Brooklyn. In 1905, the Russian Orthodox Center moves to Brooklyn. Why? Because there are a lot of Greek Catholics, Ukrainian Catholics, that need to be converted. These, these ideas are at the heart of our problem being Catholics. Latin Catholics or Roman Catholics have a typical vision at this time, in the 1880s, 1890s, that any majority group has. The majority in a group says, why can't you be like us? What's the problem? And if you ask them, why can't you be like us? They go, well, we would never think of it. So when you're the big boy or the big girl on the block, and you have all the power, you want unity of discipline, everyone to follow my law, and unity of jurisdiction, everyone to be under my power. So these two ideas was what caused a lot of problems in a young church that was trying to put roots down in America. And I think because of that, the Eastern Catholics always thought of themselves as a lesser value. And instead of doing their job of evangelizing, they began to take on a psychology of survival. Like any immigrant group, close the walls, build them higher, you have to survive, and you're not doing your job. This, this quotation 
I've read a lot. A married clergy was one of those visible signs. Not the only one, but the most visible sign that even to this day causes consternation. And so the Latin bishops in 1893 in Chicago said, you know, we don't mind if these people even leave the faith as long as we have peace. So the end is low quotation. The possible loss of a few souls of the Greek rite bears no proportion to the blessings resulting from uniformity of discipline. And remember, the discipline, the picture of Catholicism is my picture, because I'm the big guy on the block. It's never your picture. It's never your tradition. It's mine. So can you imagine a Catholic bishop saying, we don't care if these people leave the church. Wow. Problematic. Here you have Father John Wojanski and his wife, Paulina. Some of the stuff I'm going, to, I'm going to go through quicker because this has been shown in the past. Uh, and you know, she died in Brazil. She's buried in, in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, this is the first church in Shenandoah, which they often called Shenandor. Father, Father Wojanski had a priest, Father uh, Zenon Yakovich. And he was only here six months. The poor guy died. But the interesting thing, in his funeral procession, the first Catholic labor group participated, the Knights of Labor, because both Father Zenon and Father Ivan Volyansky had started a branch of the Knights of Labor. And I believe he was the first Catholic priest involved in that way in the labor movement in the United States. This is Dr. Volodymyr Simonovich. This is America, the very first issue that was published in 1886. All of you know that Ivan Franco was called to be the editor and had agreed and then had to rescind because he was having trouble in Halachina. Dr. Simonovich ended up in Chicago. The reason I'm mentioning all these things is I'm trying to give a picture of how a church works from the press, the mass media of its day, from the organizations of lay people in its day, so what the priests do, some of the oppositions, and some of the failings. This is the first Ukrainian brick book printed in the USA in Mount Carmel in 1897 and it was distributed at the UNA convention in Mayfield, PA. A few years ago I gave a nice talk about all the advertisements in the book, all the businesses. And if you want a picture of our church about 1900, take a look at this one. These are three priests, Bonchelski, Timkiewicz, and Pidhoretsky, in Cafe Boulevard and 2nd Avenue in Manhattan. I think that the Cafe Boulevard was where the 2nd Avenue Deli eventually was. Uh, it was called the Hungarian Village at this time, in 1900. And you can see that they have the, the white collar and two straw hats and a bowler. But it's interesting to look at that. The immigrants and business and church. Who established the churches? The prime movers were the saloon keepers. The saloon keepers had capital, and the saloon keepers had connections. And in the local town, everyone went to the saloon. If you're happy, you go to the saloon. If you're sad, you go to the saloon. If you're melancholy, you have to go to the saloon. You know how in the churches they say, oh, the priest yelled at my grandmother, we never go to that church again. Never happens in bars. <laughs> People yell at you, scream, you have a fight. The next day you go to the other bar. And you go, boy, i got to keep going to the bar because this is good for me. So bar, bars have a beautiful uh, facet of their existence that everyone goes there. And that's why the bartenders were one of the first people. They would pick the land, help organize in finances, even give loans. And lo and behold, 
when they built the churches, they were close to their place of business. And then they would advertise, if you're having a baptism, a wedding, or a funeral, come to our bar to celebrate or to mourn. Because saloons in those times always had a section where there were chairs and tables on the eating section. And next to the bar, it was against the law to have any seating. If you watch the old cowboy movies in the 1890s, there's no seating next to the bar. That was against the law. If you can't stand, you can't drink. If you can't reach the bar, you do young. So, so it's one of those interesting things about laws. It was against the law to have seating next to bars. You had to belly up to the bar, and you had to walk away from the bar. If not, they drag you away. This is our working people, and the Knights of Labor, uh, there are all kinds of horror stories of people dying in the, in the mines, people being impaled by rock slides, and just dropping the body off next to the house. Your husband's dead, good luck, make sure you're out of the house by next week. All kinds of horrible stories. So the Knights of Labor and the church, not just the priests, but everybody, We'll, we'll solve that, and I will give you two examples of how they address those issues. The 1895 census was the first census of Eastern Catholics that was done by the Roman Catholic or the Latin Catholic bishops. And I found that under Greeks. If you study the Ukrainian Catholic Church or the Ruthenian Catholic Church, don't look for Ruthenian. Look for Greek. Because often you'll see them under Greeks. Well, I found this in uh, Dunwoody in Yonkers, New York, in the New York uh, Archdiocese archives. And this is some of what they gave, 50, 60 families in the Greek church in the city of Cleveland. You know, number estimate in the vicinity, about 360 people. Then you have Santa Fe in Denver, Syria, Greek Catholics, Pueblo. I was in Pueblo, Colorado. It's not a great metropolis. They have the Boar's Head Inn and a couple of other bars and some military facilities. But in 1895, there were 105 Eastern Catholics. So the 1905 report, which was a successive report, gives sort of the clergy that we had 81 priests at that time and about 300,000 faithful. I don't know if you remember this. This is an article in New York Times from 1898. Trustees and pastor are at odds. Uh, did anyone remember this? <laughs> I'll tell you this. It's a very cute story since I'm from Yonkers, New York. Uh, th this is from St. Nicholas Church. It's the first Eastern Catholic Church in Yonkers. And the pastor comes in one Sunday and the doors are nailed shut. He was preaching against alcoholism, and the two trustees were saloon keepers, so they nailed the doors shut. You see how well the church works when people cooperate. <laughs> this is an important thing. On September 26, 1900, one of our great priests, Father Konstantkevich, John C. Konstantkevich, and his parishioners were involved in a strike. And this is a short one. I just want to read you what it says here. The latest, this is in Shamokin, PA, September 26, 1900. The latest development of the strike in this region is the action taken by the Russian Greek Catholic Church, Reverend John C. Konstantkevich, Vicar General of the Greek Church in the United States. I have never seen that before and have to verify that. And Pastor, some days ago he took the side of the strikers, the coal mine strikers, and since then he has spoken in many towns and villages of the region, encouraging his compatriots to resist to the utmost in a peaceable manner all efforts to make them return to work until their grievances have been redressed. Today he made the following statement. My parishioners are striking for the redress of certain grievances and they will remain out on strike 
until a peaceable and satisfactory settlement is reached. Our church property is valued at considerably over $25,000. In the deplorable event of the strike being prolonged over many months and the miners begin to suffer from hunger, we will mortgage our property to the last cent and divide it amongst the sufferers. If the strike still continues, when this money has been exhausted, and if the operators carry out their threats to flood the mines, my people will depart from this town, leaving church, mines, everything to seek better circumstances elsewhere. Other foreign churches may follow him. Father Koch is the only minister still speaking against the strike and the methods of the United Mine Workers. Everything in this neighborhood remains quiet and not a wheel is turning. So this is in 1900, very active, and he was known to be like this for all his life. I've read many good things about him. But this is a public statement that we will mortgage the church, use all the money, and these people have a right to have their grievances addressed. And look, if it doesn't work out, we're leaving. And this is that long article about the strike. However, this wasn't the first time. I found an article from February 6th, 1888, during the time of Father John Volansky. Now, I mentioned how between the Latin Church and the Eastern Catholic Churches, there was a lot of friction. But just because there's some friction doesn't mean there isn't any cooperation. There was, even at the beginning. So the Polish Catholic priest, Father Leonard Kevich, and the Ukrainian Catholic priest, Father Ivan Volyansky, were in Shenandoah, and there was a riot about to happen. And let me read from that article to you. The failure of the mob to make an attack that everyone looked for so impatiently and with so much certainty was soon after explained. A party of about 60 Poles and Hungarians had been marching about town at different times during the day shouting, bread or blood. Not a bad catchphrase if you're in Venezuela, but this is, this is a horrible thing to do bread or blood, while they marched and drank. And by five o'clock, were well filled with whiskey and enthusiasm. <laughs> Not that any of us has been there. They boasted repeatedly that they had met and defeated the police twice, and that the third time they would utterly rout them. When they finally reached the foot of Main Street, and were turning out of town on the road to the William Penn Mine. The two priests mentioned encountered them. Respect for the cloth was at once shown in halting at the command of the clergy, both of whom forthwith began to address the crowd in their different languages, speaking Polish, Lithuanian, and other Rusin dialects, and Greek. I assume that's Ukrainian. They told the mob that they were on their way to accomplish an unlawful object, and that they would meet with armed resistance and a force of superior numbers, that this force had the law of the country with them, and were authorized to shoot down men who opposed them. If this errand was persisted in, some would undoubtedly be killed, and that the church would not give its rights or allow interment in consecrated ground to those killed. When the priest, after pleading with the mob to turn back, suddenly became aggressive and commanded them to do so and invoked calamity upon those who disobeyed, the effect was magical, and the mob melted away like the snow under the rays of the hot sun. Now they probably would have strung the priest up and get on with the mob. <laughs> but in those days, 
the important thing here is that the Polish Catholic priests and the redeeming Greek Catholic or Ukrainian priests were cooperating with each other. Even though Wodanski had been suspended by Archbishop Ryan of Philadelphia in 1884, here they're cooperating on the local level. So this just gives you an idea of how the priests are involved with what their church, what their people are doing and what is necessary. This was the end of the uh, article. There was a business, church, and social consciousness. When I went through the 1897 calendar, these are the businesses that advertised in the church calendar. A hotels, company stores, a brewery, saloon, butcher, grocer, tailor, uh, the UNA Svoboda newspaper, and a cobbler. And five of these businesses mentioned, we are close to your church. Well, it's, 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 it's business and it's not bad. So, flash forward. Bishop Ortinsky, I will mention a little bit about him, but not too much. This is Sheptinsky, because we talked about the church in America. But one of the things that happens with the advancement of sea transport and the industrial age, that labor is needed and there are conveyances to get labor across the ocean. So our church beginning from a little church in Austria-Hungary, is spreading throughout the world. And this is Szepinski, the Bishop of Lviv, on a white horse, visiting the people in Argentina. This is Chodobai, he was, he was one of the first administrators. This is Father Khanat, who was the very first one, who died in 1898. I don't know if you know his story. On his deathbed, he sent two priests to Alexis Toth, the father of orthodoxy in the United States, and asked him for his forgiveness. And Father Alexis Toth, who himself was sick, sent the priest back and said, I accept. Please ask him for his forgiveness, because when our nature is at its weakest, Mercy is the most needed. So the first administrator of Greek Catholics and the father of Orthodoxy, who were both friends, ended their life in mutual forgiveness and compassion. And it's a story that's almost never told because people like to tell fights. You know, look at the bad stuff that, that's, you know, the nun beat me up in grammar school. Oh my God, obviously not enough. <laughs> but you rarely see good stories. There's a famous documentary on Channel 13 that was done by the same person who did the Civil War documentary. And it's called Faith, Hope, and Science, about one small Franciscan nun who was a witness to a horrible catastrophe of both flood and uh, tornadoes. And she saw people suffering and she set about saying, I want to alleviate human suffering. So she went to the local doctor and says, I am going to start a hospital. Will you be our doctor? And there was no land and there was no money. But he said, I'm an agnostic, but if you build it in two years, I'll be your doctor. As you know, Nuns are very stubborn, in a very loving sort of way. <laughs> they did it, and they found, and this little Franciscan nun founded the Mayo Clinic, oh. which to this day is innovating in patient care records. Uh, one of their innovations was to put a nice laboratory right next to the operating room, so that during the operation you can get results that the files would follow the patient, and many other things. But this is just to show when we're talking about a church, including our own, the best way to kill a religion is to keep it in church. Make it absolutely useless, 
and no good for anything. The best way is to go out and do whatever you're doing and do it well and do it for the sake of others so people can see that you're for real. Now truth is not preached by character. You can be the best person in the world, doesn't mean you're right, or the worst, doesn't mean you're wrong. But it does make what you stand for at least a little bit more believable. And that's what people do in history. So the reason I put Khanna and uh, Father Saint Alexis Toff is that they ended up on sort of competing or opposite sides of the church, but they finished their life in peace and reconciliation. This is the first bishop at 40 years of age, just shaved his beard, a young guy, didn't know what he was getting into, and he was the first Eastern Catholic bishop in the Western Hemisphere. He made it possible for all the other Eastern churches to have a hierarchy, a jurisdiction. This is him in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Devil's Den was where the sniper was. This is him in Yorktown, Virginia, with Sheptitsky blessing 222 acres where the, civil, where the Revolutionary War had ended in Yorktown, Virginia. Uh, eventually it was purchased by the government in the 1920s. When he wrote, he wrote in Ukrainian, Slovak, and Hungarian. So this is part of his work. This is the convention of the UNA, or the Ruski Narodny Soyuz in Philadelphia in 1908. This is a close-up of that picture, and that's Bishop Bortinsky, about 41 years of age. This is the first cathedral before it was painted. It was St. Jude's Episcopal Church when we purchased it. Originally, our first cathedral was on Buttonwood, the St. Michael's Church. Ninth and Buttonwood. And this is the first English translation of the liturgy done by Andrew Shipman on Sunday, October 22, 1911. It was the blessing of St. George's Church in Manhattan. And Andrew Shipman was, as you know, the Yonkers Parish St. Michael's established St. George's. Because we're the older parish. I'm from Yonkers. I'm a a Yonkers man. Yonkers as a city is also older than Philadelphia. We're from 1646. Most of us uh, were not born at that time, but we remember. <laughs> so, Andrew Shipman was a Catholic layman and lawyer in Manhattan, and he went to Halichina to Andrew Sheptitsky, studied Old Slavonic to translate the liturgy into English. And this is the first English translation that we have in the United States. Uh, this is his picture. These are two good lawyers. Andrew Shipman is on your left, and Michael Kearns, uh, William Kearns, is on your right. Uh, William Kearns was the lawyer even for Bohachowski and Takach a little bit. Uh, his grandson still runs a law firm in New Jersey. <coughs> This is a young woman who looks like a nun. <laughs> you forget how young. Volyansky was 27 years old when he wow. came to the United States. Wow. I believe his wife, Paulina, was 25. Wow. So these people are young. I don't know the exact age here, but I think she was in her late 20s or early 30s. Early 30s. Early 30s when she passed away. Wow. Right? She died also in 1916. Ivan Franco died in 1916. Uh, the Apostolic Delegate died in 1916. 1916 was partially the beginning of the influenza epidemic, but there was, but there was no uh, penicillin, and so people would die simply of a cold or pneumonia. So a lot of people died during that year. And that's the, the orphanage. Uh, this is a protest uh, which is a defense of the bishop. Uh, when you read the people speaking about their church, they were a lot more vocal than we are now. They were tough. Both sides. I mean, people wrote without censorship. 
<laughs> if they were upset with you, they called you names and they put it in print. They were, was it PC still a thing that you used? They were not politically correct. They were just upset. Uh, bishop John Holborn was a young bishop during the beginnings of our church. And uh, he even let his vicar general speak against our bishop. And because of him and his very tough policy, you're in America, get over it. The Polish National Catholic Church was founded, the Slovak National Catholic Church, Luthi Lithuanian National Catholic Church. These churches were founded because someone decided that you had to adopt to their way of being American and as quickly as possible. Just to remember, uh, Ortensky became a U.S. citizen on January 3rd, 1913, and this is his first advisory staff and consultants. This is an application for a passport when he studied in Rome. And I think I mentioned this once, but I decided to do it again. When you're doing research, passport applications at that time did not have a picture attached. But they did have little things like age 48, stature 5 foot 10, forehead broad and high, nose straight, Roman type, <laughs> mouth mid-sized, full lips, chin square, hair dark mixed with gray, complexion olive high color, face round and full. So if you want to know how someone looked at that time, find their passport application. That's the last photo of Shiptinsky, of our Artinsky in January 1916. Uh, the guy with the beard is also Eastern Catholic. He's a great looking beard. That's Yazbek, I believe is the name. This is the funeral of Bishop Ortinsky. There were about I'd, I'm guessing, I'm guessing, I forget, it was it 30,000 people attending? There was a lot. There was actually a, a newsreel made of it that I've never been able to find. Uh, the President of the United States was in town and gave a, uh, a bouquet of flowers in the shape of a cross. So in 1916, was it, was it Wilson that was President of the United States? And these are the brotherhoods who were standing in the procession. Uh, this is, you know, all the flowers. If you see here, this is the cross of flowers that was given by the president. He was in Philadelphia to see his oculist, optometrist, and get some glasses. And I told you we would see the good and the bad. Uh, you know this story. Uh, Father Vastil Stechuk was a, a married priest with two children and there was another married priest that was transferred from Chicago to McAdoo, Pennsylvania and his wife was very upset I don't know, McAdoo is a very small uh, mining town and Chicago in the roaring 20s was the place to be so one of the things about transfers of any job is your life changes. You lose your friends, sometimes you lose certain acquaintances, your jobs, opportunities. And she was so upset that she went into church and shot him dead. Yeah, he's buried out here next to the cross. Father Vasil Stachuk. His children lived in Chicago until the 1980s. Uh, the one who, who killed him was Mrs. Emilia Strutinska. Her brother had shot Count Potatsky in the view and ran away to Rochester, New York. And when he found out his sister had shot the priest, she goes, good, that's how we take care of things in our family. <laughs> oh. So scandals and tragedies are nothing new from the New Testament to the present day. You always have to do, and sometimes when I argue with my atheist brothers and sisters, I go, remember, Holodomor is your, your doing. It's quite a few million people killed. But what I have a, as an image, whether you're a believer or non-believer or somewhere in between, if you do something bad, you belong to a group of people who do something bad. And when you do something good, which is always possible, you get yourself back on the right track. Right? So every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. And that's part of our preaching, that optimism and that hope for humanity. 
But uh, you, I pray over his grave every time I visit the cemetery because he's right there. He's right there. This is Shepinski as a young bishop in 1900. Because we see him a lot as an old man. So this is him at 35, Bishop of Stanislavia. So that's Andrew Sheptitsky. Remember, he was about 6'8", six, 6'8", eight, six, eight, very tall guy, very talented. And we forget what a man of faith he was. Because in the 1900s or 1890s, while our people were immigrating here, Europe was the place to be. And he had all Europe at his feet. This is a count. This is a doctor of law, doctor of theology, six foot eight inches tall. And he says, you know what? With everything that God has given me, I want to become a Brazilian monk. Oh my God. <laughs> Ukrainians didn't trust him. The Polish people didn't trust him. You know, everyone's saying, what's he crazy? What's he doing? Because often historians have a hard time attributing spiritual ideals and goals to human action. Even when you read about the church, there's always some political motive. But with this person and the way he ended his life, and all the people he saved, including so many Jewish people during World War II, while he himself was an invalid, it's sort of a great statement of what a church should be and how church people should act. So that's a great example, and Sheptitsky is worth, worth us emulating him. When he came in 1923, he uh, came for orphans. And he actually had a public firm, I think in Chicago, but I'm not certain about that, make these brochures up, and it says, Do you see the Holy Cross, this tiny little hut? Surely you are not going to allow the fate of this simple folk to remain unrewarded and their prayer unanswered. And there's a poor woman next to a hut with her little child. This is following World War I, following the influenza epidemic, and who was going to take care of the orphans? In the United States, the Brazilian sisters, and their ship Tisky came over, having been in prison until 1917, and saying, how can I help these people? And he did gather and this is the only place where I see his signature in English. And his, he signs Andrew, not Andre, in English, Andrew. And the original is in our museum in Stanford. This is him in Philadelphia. You see how tall he is compared to everybody else? See that tall? And that's me right next to him. <laughs> but that's him for uh, visiting Philadelphia in 1921. It was often mistakenly labeled as him blessing the cathedral in 1910. But that's, that's not it, because the Brazilian sisters weren't here in 1910, and they're part of the procession. So that's 1920-21. This is Bohachowski when he became bishop, and he was noted for education. So St. Basil's College in 1939, and this is interesting. The Philadelphia Ukrainian National Association Youth Club realizes the utter necessity of a Ukrainian university and takes this opportunity to offer its initial aid to this worthy campaign. Uh, Dietrich Slobogin, president, Harry Marchishin, George Slobogin, William Yutzvik, Dr. Walter Galan, and Stephen Slobogin. But at that time, St. Basil was supposed to be the first Ukrainian Catholic University, but never took off. But once again, what does a church do? You have to do something. You, you can't, you know, people say, oh, thoughts and prayers, they're upset. Well, I'd be upset too if people said just thoughts and prayers and didn't feed me. But that's part of it. Thoughts and prayers and work, right? The monastic or Benedictine motto, ora et labora, work and pray. Or in my favorite quotation from Clint Eastwood, the spirit ain't worth spit without sweat. <laughs> and the Brazilian sisters have sweated a lot. So St. Basil's Academy was founded in 31, St. Basil's Prep School in 33, many high schools and primary schools, nursery schools, orphanage, and the seminaries in Stanford and Washington, D.C. As a trivia, 
the Catholic, the entire, all the Catholic, the Catholic private school system in the United States was the largest school system in the history of the world that was private. Oh. It was big. In fact, there's a story of, in one jurisdiction where the government didn't want to give buses to Catholic schools. So the bishop called up the mayor or the governor and said, tomorrow you will have 130,000 of your citizens going to your public schools because we're closing all the Catholic schools. Good luck. So he got the buses. Uh, that's September 1933. Uh, that's the blessing of St. Basil's uh, prep school. And they all have umbrellas because it was a rainy day. So now we just want to go over to Ukraine, to the Soviet Union. From 1946 to 1989, we're the largest persecuted faith group in the world, and almost no one knows about it. And in the United States, people think churches just make Parahe and Holochi. So the church is forced underground by the USSR. Metropolitan Slipi's spiritual father is in Siberia for 18 years. I still think the older I get, the more profound that statement is. You know, people say, oh, religion is just about church. I, you know, about money. Religion is just about money. You hear that a lot, right? I go, yeah, for me, but not for everybody. <laughs> but here's, here's the head of the church in a Siberian work camp and in other places where he was simply because he believes and he's a person of principle. 18 years by an atheistic regime. Another thing I tell my atheistic brothers and sisters, I go, you know, we're not the only ones doing bad stuff, but we're all part of the same human family, so let's focus on what we can do good together. So the propaganda against Ukrainian Catholics was funded by Soviet authorities. In fact, on, and this one book I have here I can show you, this was published in 1981. It's called Shvastikas on the Sultans. And the last page it says, it calls us foreign clerical nationalists are entirely lacking in future prospects. They have a picture of Bishop Lawson in the Sum camp in Allenville mm -hmm. saying he's taking part in some Banderite underground movement. No. But even your enemies give you a lot of good information because had they, they had access to certain archives. And the one good thing is about this book is the warnings against communism because they write it out that we did warn the communism as a system in the real world is tough you know my parents are, were raised under communism they always, they always say it's very easy to be a communist in america <laughs> go to where they live and see how long you last so there's also a good book about yosef slippe in the documents of the KGB. It's a two-volume set. It was, it was published in Ukraine. But even his enemies were amazed at the fact that he was a man of commitment. In his own autobiography published a few years ago, he was for the... Now, this is a professor, a doctorate of philosophy and theology out of Innsbruck, Austria, a man who was a scholar and a seminary rector, ends up in the Soviet prison with murderers, cannibals, all kinds of people. And he writes in his little diary, later on when he was released, he goes, I did not know that such creatures even existed. And now I was with them in the same room. So when, when you think about that and how this person in the prime of his life, have to spend, has to spend 18 years just surviving, not creating, not publishing, not educating future clergy, but just surviving. I still think that lesson of his life that he did not give in to, they promised him two things. You could be number two guy in Moscow, or you could be the number one guy in Kiev. And he said no. So. Uh, 
it's a, it's a great statement of faith in the modern era. You know, there, there's even the, the movie that was made on the fictitious shoes of the fishermen. Some of you may remember Anthony Quinn starred in that. And as the Soviet authorities release him, they say, you are free. And he goes, I have always been free. You know, freedom is from God, not from people. That's why the slaves during the Civil War said, no one freed us, God made us free. You made it legal. So it's an important thing as a church to realize. And of course, Sheptitsky here was honored by the, uh, by the Jewish people at their 100th anniversary of the Anti-Defamation League as one of the righteous who saved many Jews. This is a calendar uh, from the National Holocaust Museum where he was also honored. And remember, his last 18 years of his life were not spent in Siberia, but mostly as an invalid that had to be carried around because he couldn't walk. People forget that. He was doing all this as an invalid, not as someone in the prime of life, which is also a great statement of faith. Father Chinoski often used to say when they asked Shaptitsky, how are you? He goes, very bad, thank God. <laughs> well, to conclude before your multifaceted questions, in the 1970 Christmas letter of Archbishop Joseph Tawil of the Melchite Greek Catholic Diocese called The Courage to Be Ourselves, he makes the following statement, to be open to others, to be able to take our rightful place on the American church scene, we must start by being fully ourselves. It is only in our distinctness that we can make any kind of contribution to the larger society. It is only by being what we are that we retain a reason for existence at all. So whatever we are called, it can never be as important as who we are. Humble followers of our Savior Jesus Christ with a beautiful tradition based in Greek and Ukrainian roots. So we have a mission, and the church's mission is not survival. It's faithfulness, and it's serving the people, even if you're the last one of your breed. Any questions? Then we'll take up the collection now, or? <laughs> yeah, this is the cathedral. Bishop Bertinsky is buried there in the crypt. Yes? I just wanted to make a comment, going right back to, to your first statement um, about Ruthenian. Yes. And our being Ruthenians. And uh, M Mother Helena, our foundress, mm. when she came to the United States, she was, uh, you might say, identified as Ruthenian. So is Bishop Bertinsky in the 1910 census. Yeah. Self-identified as yeah, Ruthenian. Yeah. So it was, it was... Uh, it was the way it was used. It was way, the way it was used, and it was also the identity, I think, took on a little different meaning than history gives it all the time. Right. Um, sometimes every nationality is made up. Every country is made up. We know when the United States was made up. And being made up is not a bad thing. People find similarities between language, culture, expression, geography, and they want to become united. And sometimes within that group, if there's a fight, and someone says something very harsh, or you're dumb, why don't you just agree with me? Then you have splits. Then someone will call themselves, well, I'm not the type of Ruthenian you are, I'm a different type of Ruthenian. And in, in the United States, as time goes on, obviously those distinctions are very, very shallow. Because we've grown up in this country and some people have never seen the old country, some have. But what I find as a historian, remember I said the people were very blunt? Even if you're right, the way you approach certain things is tough. Now, my parents are from the Mkushja. And so if someone says you're dumb or you're stupid, you're this or you're that, the natural reaction is I know who I am, stop telling me who I am. So, so the Ruthenian, 
everyone called themselves Rusin, right? 1890s, I found something, the earliest I found in America printed Ukrainian was like 1902. Now there may have been earlier, but that's what I find. But Rusin was the thing, Ortensky used it exclusively, but Ortensky would, would argue with people from, from the Hungarian side of the Austrian, Hungarian Empire and said, I'll be a better Rusin than you'll ever be. Well, how can you argue that sort of thing? You know, there, there was a lot of bad blood because people got into fights. They were hot-headed instead of calmly discussing things. And both sides, or three sides, and then sometimes the Russians who were financed by the Tsar, of course, you, you belong to us. We're brothers and sisters. And so there was a lot of problems. You know, it's like the present situation in Ukraine. Take over Crimea, kill a few people, but keep on saying, we're brothers and sisters. It's, it's a harder thing to believe after blood is spilled, and even harder to believe if it's just an argument. Because you met some, I met, father met, you meet some of those older people, and they were really wounded by the words that were said. And maybe if they were said in a nice way, if they were in conversation, then we would have more unity. But that's the problem of a, hu a human thing. It's a miracle that we survived at all. We didn't have a bishop for about 40 years, so it was very tough. When you say Ortinsky um, corresponded with Hungarians, do you mean the people today in the state that we would say are in Hungary or in the general Austria-Hungarian Empire? Well, he corresponded with the Greek Catholics, the Ruthenian Greek Catholics, or the Rusins in Hungary and from Hungary. Okay. So, you know, the Austria-Hungarian had two parliaments, one in Budapest, and one in Vienna. And so you had Greek Catholics coming from both sides and Episcopal interests and political interests were also, so Ortinsky would get letters, are you making them, you know, Galician? We, we don't want them to stop becoming Hungarian. And many priests would speak Hungarian at home, just like many priests today speak English. And some speak Ukrainian, some speak Hungarian still, some may speak other languages. But to be Catholic, you have to live with multiple ethnicities and multiple even citizenships, which we did, which we did. Now our Bishop Ortinsky, when he came here, he was coming here to stay. So that's why he got his citizenship papers and he died as a citizen of the United States. He was here to be with his people and to serve his people wherever they are. Now it's interesting, Jesus never had citizenship. You know, he's part of the Roman Empire, but he was not a citizen of Rome because he couldn't afford it. So getting along in a church is, is always problematic. You know, where two or three people are gathered in my name, there's a need for canon law. You know, parents know this as soon as you have your first child. The very first thing you do is you make laws. Don't do that. Get here. No one touch anyone ever again. Very <laughs> much as a historian, do you ever wonder how our church in the United States would have developed if it had not been split in 1944 into the two branches? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. If we would have had a bishop earlier, remember, we lost thousands of people to Russian Orthodoxy because there just wasn't priests. Be, before and after Ortinsky arrived, what some, and this is public knowledge, this is not to attack Russian Orthodox, this is to try to see how were things done. Some of the Russian Orthodox would say, you're a cantor because when they sent priests from Moscow, the people who didn't understand Russian would say, we want a priest who speaks how? Mm -hmm. right? he wants, we, want some, we don't understand this guy from Moscow. So they would go to the local cantor and say, how much money do you make? Say, 50 bucks a month. We'll give you 300. He says, well, I'm not a priest. We'll make you a priest. Oh. I can't go to school. Three weeks, you'll be done. <laughs> you know all the services. Yeah. And, and that's what happened, that you had people who were cantors, 
who were paid, or other people who knew the language, and they, they became the priests of these congregations. There was no bishop. There was no one to uh, organize things. The corporation laws were different. So if you, if you got onto the church committee, you could vote yourself as the sole proprietor of the place or sell the church and its property, or have it become Russian Orthodox. So, around the United States, you will see but it's Russian Orthodox. That means it was probably built by Ruthenian Greek Catholics, and at some point in history, it became Russian Orthodox, and it was taken over, and then other people had to build a new church. Sometimes, like in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, it goes to the Supreme Court, and the Catholics who were only 30 families out of 300, get the church back after eight years. Why? Because the court case was St. Michael's Ruthenian Greek Catholic Church against the Ruthenian Greek Catholic Bishop Bohachowski. So the Supreme Court judge, or whatever the highest court is in Rhode Island, said, you claim to be Catholic, you're suing the Catholic bishops, by law you have to obey the laws of your church, the bishop owns the building. And so they lost. But you can imagine how much acrimony, how much hurt, how much pain. So Ruthenian Greek Catholics, Ukrainian Catholics make the best Latin Catholics, the best Protestants, the best atheists. We really do. We're very, very apt. And we fit in very well. And we do wonderful stuff. One other thing, a point I have to make. Being a pastor for so long, sometimes people say, why doesn't our church do this? I go, but you're doing that. Good people throughout our parishes, because we have mostly small parishes, do wonderful things, but they don't look at themselves as being the church doing wonderful things. From taking care of a grandchild to being part of any kind of civic organization, I go, if any part of the church does something good, the church is doing that good item. You know, why should we only accept when bad things are done, that's us. But when good things are done, so sometimes just to convince the parishioners that that's our church doing that good thing, taking care of the grandchild, uh, taking part in blood drives, and doing a lot of other social action, that's our church. If you're a parishioner, that's our church doing wonderful things. And somehow, you know, a part of the whole brings glory on the whole organization. It's a, little, it's a simple concept, but sometimes people can't see it. You know, there's no reason that, that priest should, could, or would be the motor behind anything the church does, or all the things the church does. Church has a mind of its own, and adults should do adult things without being told to do them, the way I look at it. Yes? Uh, there was a slide that, one of the slides of an article um, about Tinsky's, Bishop Tinsky's funeral, mm -hmm. and it said, um, some, something to the effect of Bishop Rutinsky uh, killed by his own. Yes. Was that an American publication or a Ukrainian publication that was, in the English language? I, I, I'm, I'm just, yeah. just it, was it, was it was Ukrainian. It was Ukrainian. It was Ukrainian. Uh, uh, the exact Ukrainian, I don't know if it was Zamuchini Suyime to Zabeti Suyime, but Father Derzhuruka was one of the first people in the America magazine that wrote about the procession and the funeral. I believe the first flowers were from the Yurtinsky family, because they're different bouquets. And the second bouquet was from either Father Dejeruka, but it appeared in America. I have the picture of the original page. And the second one was either from Petriuski, who was his secretary, or Father Dejeruka, and it said, killed by his own. Because it, it's, a it's a tough job. It's, Anyone who does any job in any organization, you know how it's tough. And sometimes bishops can be almost non-human. And you forget, you know, they're human. There's an old story in the Dominican house in Washington, D.C. Since it was such a big building, they sent the plans to Rome for approval. It came back. If you are angels, don't worry about this, but if you are not angels, put in bathrooms. Put in bathrooms. They, they built a building in D.C. 
according to these plans, with no bathrooms. <laughs> you, you, you know, you can't forget the humanity of any person you study. These are human beings. They're dealing with he, real human issues, and sometimes we mechanize them or distort them. And we do the same thing to politicians. Children do the same thing to their parents. They think they don't have a heart. They're useless, outmoded, except if they, they're like an ATM machine. So <laughs> we do this often. So when you study history and you, and you think about anybody, these are human beings with human problems, human issues, and human needs. They have to eat. Because I, I remember my parishioners, sometimes you have like two funerals, two baptisms, very small parishes, but an hour and a half apart. And I said, I can't do all that, you know. I have to eat sometime. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> yeah. It's like people forget, you know. There are human limitations, and it's, it's a very humbling thing to realize you have human limitations. There's one Savior. I'm not Him. Let Jesus take care of the rest. And that's an important thing to remember. So Zabiti Svayim, Zamuchini Svayim, was just some of the priests saw how much suffering he had. And you know, when we criticize someone, we think it's harmless because they're the mayor of the town, the president of the United States, or other people. But these words have an effect on a human being because sooner or later they reach someone. They, they're, they're real. Words have a profound power, and we should be careful how we use them. You know, charity. And so, yeah, that was in the America Magazine, 1916. It was in March. The funeral was March 30th. I don't know if that appeared the 30th exactly or the day after. But as I say, in those days, oh, you know, there are priests that protested against Sertinsky, like, 56 of them, they signed, they signed a 20-page scathing rebuttal, and these are all the crazy things our bishop did. You don't have much of that now. You really don't. I mean, people were tough, and they did not moderate their tongues. You know, the Bible says if you control your tongue, you're a saint. Regarding Ortensky, this is just a little uh, human um, uh, interest for you. Mm -hmm. Are there any Ortinskys um, after the bishop uh, in the United States? Yes, yes. He has, he has family. He has family. Um, I met one of them. I don't know the whole family line, but Joseph Ortinsky survived. He was the executor, I believe. Uh, he's the one that owned the land. Some of the... I'll give you... I believe it was Joseph. I have to read my own book again just to find out. Uh, Joseph Ortinsky received the insurance policy of Bishop Ortinsky. When he died in his will, he said, no property or money can be sold or gotten rid of until the new bishop arrives. Well, it was eight years until Bishop Wojcicki arrived, from 1916 to 1924. We have World War I, and we have the influenza epidemic going on. So, there was a $40,000 life insurance policy which Ortinsky's brother gave to the, or loaned to the diocese to pay off its creditors. Because there, Ortinsky had founded the Ruthenian Bank. And you know, just like in the movie A Wonderful Life, there's a run on the bank, you know? Well, there was a run, the bishop died, where's my money? I want my hundred bucks. Well, your hundred bucks is in the cathedral. It's in the buildings on Franklin Street. It's in, you know, Yorktown, Virginia. And so to stop the eparchy from going bankrupt, Bishop Ortinsky brother gave the life insurance policy to the eparchy. He really did a heroic deed, or else everything would have got under. It would have been a lot of trouble. So you have these heroic people, you know, who make it possible for us to be in the building like this. I was told my parishioners, you're not getting wet because someone gave money. Someone cared about this. You're getting married because there's a building for you to be married in. This, this, this stuff doesn't pop out of nowhere. It pops out of someone's life who is generous and loving and makes a sacrifice. And then everyone benefits. I just, want to, I just wanted to make the comment of the use of the word Greek Catholic. Mm -hmm. Growing up, it was, uh, for me, it was uh, Ukrainian Greek Catholic and, and 
it's like to explain to anyone first I yes. would say I'm Ukrainian, then Greek, that was confusing uh, because that's another nationality, mm -hmm. you know? It's but, problematic. Yeah, but, but what was interesting is, uh, what was it, last year when Archiepiscop uh, Shepchuk uh, uh, came here and did a presentation after it was about the time of the new president of Ukraine. He emphasized again that we are using the word Hreko Katolitska Tsekva. Right. So, and in, I, in Ukraine, yes. following the demise of the Soviet Union, people scooped up words. They're copyrighted almost, right? Uh, the Latin church is officially called the Ukrainian Catholic Church. That's how it registered. We registered Ukrainian Greek Catholic to differentiate itself. When Metropolitan Gujak founded the Ukrainian Catholic University, some of the Latin Catholics were upset. You should have called the Ukrainian Greek Catholic University. And he didn't. So Uku, the Ukrainian Catholic University, was that way for, for a reason. In 1914, the lawyer from, for our diocese had to go to New Jersey to actually copyright the name Greek Catholic because the Lutherans and the Presbyterians were announcing in papers, come to a Greek Catholic Mass. They would even build churches to look like Greek Catholic churches to get people here. The Lutherans have a lot of information about our early beginnings because once again, Christians love to convert other Christians. It's a very easy deal, so you, so you, you have that. But, but yeah, you always have the problem. In 1772, Maria Teresa, who helped establish our seminary in, uh, was it not Budapest, in Vienna, uh, she wanted to give us a nice name. It says, well, the people who converted by you know, Roman missionaries will be Roman Catholic. Whoever was converted by Greek missionaries will be Greek Catholic. And so that's, it was a source of origin. But we were, we, were never, we were never an ethnic church because you can't be Catholic and be ethnic at the same time exclusively. So when you're baptized Roman Catholic, you're not a citizen of the Roman Empire or Italian necessarily, right? Americans speak English, but we're not English. So you have that trouble with language. Language doesn't always catch up to reality. So people may say Ukrainian Catholic, I have to be Ukrainian. No, you don't. It's Ukrainian by baptism, not by you know, ethnic origin. So if you're Chinese and you get baptized in our church, you're Ukrainian Catholic. If you're Chinese and get baptized into the Roman, even though you're not Italian or a citizen, you're still Roman Catholic. So um, it's funny, I was talking to a priest in Boston who was a non-ethnic parish, right? And he goes, he uses about 10 different languages because everyone else who doesn't have a parish comes to his church. So he has to rent a Vietnamese priest, a Chinese priest, a Korean priest, and I think even a Ukrainian priest. Because, you know, that's you. if you're Catholic, you serve everyone, the gospel, you don't run away from your origins if you're Ukrainian and you're Greek. I mean, we would not be Christian without the Greeks. They baptized in Volodymyr. We didn't have our own clergy at that point, so probably most of them were Greeks who were baptizing us. Uh, so, but th that's always a problem where, especially when Ukraine didn't have a country, the church becomes a substitute. So it's a surrogate nation. There was even a song once in Stanford they used to sing, you know, Hreko Katolichka, Land of Bulgaria, Mirindi Krai. Uh, that they would sing a whole song about this mythical country called Greek Catholic, Hreko Katolichka. So now it's got like 10 different verses. But in some of the coal regions, if you would ask some of the people, who are you? I'm Greek Catholic. You know, it, was, it was very conflated with their identity. And that was very important to them. My mother raised me this way, my grandmother, my father. I am Greek Catholic. And don't you try to tell me I'm anything else. That's very important to them. 